what's up you guys? Marty Schwartz here with Marty Music. Thanks for checking out this video. Have you ever heard a song from your childhood and it kind of felt like you were transported back in time? Suddenly you're back where you've heard the song for the first time and you're feeling all the feels. I was curious and I needed to know why this happens. I tapped Nicole Richard, a neurologic music therapist and professor from Belmont University, to talk through how music affects our brains and memories. Nicole's research on the benefits and challenges of music therapy make her the perfect person to talk to about nostalgia, and I'm excited to share it with y'all. Can you break down like a, a basic concept of music therapy for people out there? Absolutely. A music therapist, first I'll say, is somebody who has training, so a bachelor's or a master's degree in music therapy, and they actually have to pass a board exam to become certified because it turns out there's a lot to using music and working with people and we want to do it right to be helpful, yeah. right? In a music therapy degree, students take music courses, they've got to take theory, they've got to take all the different skills that are that any music student would take. They take psychology courses, they take courses in human anatomy and physiology and then we've got specific courses on how music like affects the human person so how music affects the brain and our emotions yeah. and uh, movement and all these things it's interesting for me as a musician you know I spent years picking up the guitar every single day playing enjoying it and meanwhile all these um, scientific things are happening as a musician I'm I was never thinking about that. Sure. Yeah. Never ever thinking yeah. like, oh, what's the, you know, or the fact that vibrations are coming out in sound waves. Sure. Yeah. And then our brain is interpreting it right. and then we're taking those frequencies that are like that go together mathematically. Right. It's wild. To create harmony. I mean, yeah, it yeah. absolutely yeah. blows my mind. Yeah. It'll... So what I thought would be really cool to talk about, especially since I have an expert now, and thank <laughs> you, uh, I get to learn something today too, along with hopefully all of you out there. Let's talk about nostalgia. Yeah. For me, because I've been around a while now, you know, I'll say, Alexa, put on 80s playlist, you know? And yeah, it, yeah, immediately, yeah. there are certain songs, for instance, from the 80s, yep. song pops on, yep. and I'm immediately in my mom's backseat of her car. Yeah, yeah, Doing yeah. like errands, yeah. you know? Like yeah. boring yeah. errands, <laughs> and I can like see the, the upholstery. Uh -huh. I can see, you know, staring yeah. out the window, I can see the streets, like, the area that we're in right. and everything. You're like there. Yeah. Yeah. So where does this begin? Where does this end? Like what is what going is happening? on with this yeah. with with this phenomenon? I think it's fascinating. Yeah, it really is fascinating. It's so beautiful. I remember when I was doing my own undergrad in music therapy and my very first practicum experience was in long-term care. And so we went into this woman's room and she was kind of looked like she was sleeping, like you say, kind of checked out, just yeah. not really there almost, you yeah. know? And I was watching, observing a music therapist and she started playing this song and the woman like opened her eyes and she started singing and she just, it was like she was just there and present. We had tried to have a little conversation to her at the beginning and it didn't really work. After we sang with her, she was like having a conversation with right. us and I remember just being kind of like, okay, this is cool. <laughs> like this is, yeah, this is amazing, like, right? It's like you brought them back. Yeah, what's happening there is that in our brain, we've got different parts of our brain that um, are for different things, right? We've got areas for, for higher cognition, we've got areas for vision, we've got areas for movement, and they interact with each other and so on. But music is cool because it goes everywhere. Right. It interacts with every part of the brain. And so for when you think of nostalgia or reminiscence or these songs that all of a sudden bring us back into a specific place, they are touching areas of our emotions or limbic system. The music is activating our hippocampus, which is from memory, areas of our, our frontal lobe, which is often for some of our higher thinking kind of functions. Yeah. So all of these parts are waking up. But what all of those have in common is it, it brings back a sense of our identity, mm -hmm. like of who we are. So we call that autobiography graphical memory, right? Like you're saying, like you're remembering this yeah. in the car with your mom, that's part yeah. of your life and who you are, right? The magic number that we say is 23 years old. The, the music that you were listening to around the time, on average, when you were around 23, tends to be the stuff that sticks with you okay. through your life. Now, of course, it's maybe different for different people, but that's, sure. you know. Okay, so I have another question. This isn't yeah. as related to nostalgia, but it's just while we're here talking about it. Intervals mm. and why they emote, give us different feelings of emotion. Yeah. Right? So for instance, you know, the, yeah. the, the uh, tritone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, sorry to interrupt. Dr. Richard was talking about tritones. I wanted to get a little deeper into explaining what that means. Now, any note on any instrument 
As soon as you play another note anywhere on that instrument, you've now created what's called an interval. It's the sound of two frequencies together. The tritone is the darkest, like most sinister, like quote unquote, worst sounding interval. And it happens to be right in between the two best sounding intervals or the two like cleanest sounding intervals. And I'll show you what I mean. The first one's called the perfect fifth. So that's one d note. And that distance away is called a perfect fifth and it has a real clean sound to it. Now, another one is called the perfect fourth. Very clean sounding as well. So here's the root, our first note, the perfect fifth, and then that root and the, it's perfect fourth. The tritone is in between the perfect fourth and perfect, perfect fifth. It's the note right in between. So if you have the two most perfect sounding intervals, but there's one in between, it's gonna be the most unperfect sounding because it's closest to the two most perfect ones. So check it out. Now you can use that for effect. You can create that, that feeling of chaos by using that interval, or you can create a very smooth and perfect sounding feel with those perfect fourths and fifths. Here comes the tritone. Anyway, that's a little tritone sound. A little food for thought for you. Let's get back to the episode. That doesn't sound like a major seven chord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And literally they're just vibrations. Mm -hmm. Why does a minor chord make us or have a sad quality mm -hmm. and a major chord we could perceive as happy is mm -hmm. part of it. We've heard a minor third connects us to sad like a million years ago, did we not <laughs> connect that? Or right, right. has it always existed? Right, so there's a couple different things. One of them is that it, it really depends on where you live and what music you grew up with. People who grew up in like like Western music context um, who are used to the major and the minor scales, which are very much now associated with major, happy, minor, sad, yeah, yeah. you know, in our kind of subconsciousness, you just learn that really quickly because you grow up in that environment. Yeah. So there's a part of it that's conditioned, you know, folks who grew up in, uh, listening to Indian raga music or other other cultural music that has completely different state scales and maybe isn't using like a 12 note diatonic scale, there's gonna be different associations that if I was to go and listen to that music, I may not know, well, what's the happy music and what's the sad music because I my ear's not used to it. Right. So part of it is just kind of conditioning, but there is something in the science part in terms of, you know, you played a, a before a diminished intro. Do you wanna play that again? Or yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The yeah. tritone there? Yeah. Or. Yeah, 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 right? And we all recognize that as like, ooh, it's kind of yeah, crunchy, yeah, yeah. like, ooh. It comes down to the harmonic series. So when we play a note, I'm gonna just play like one random note on your guitar. Okay, so when we hear that note, we're not only hearing that, that one note, we're actually hearing also the octave above and the fifth above that, and then another octave and the third and so on. Until? Until it keeps going. But yeah. but the first, the most prominent notes above that we hear are the fifth and the third. And so there is a sense of a, a major triad being something that's familiar to your ear, but subconsciously. Okay. And so it might be that in the tritone interval doesn't kind of come till later. So it might be that our ears sort of subconsciously or some kind of level are, are actually designed to hear um, consonants in these octaves and fifths, okay. and the tritone just doesn't sound as, as good. Hold on a second. What's a harmonic series? I'm glad you asked. Let's get a little deeper into it. What Nicole is referring to is something called the harmonic series or the overtone series. The harmonic series happens on a guitar and in similar ways for other instruments because of the complex vibration of the strings. Imagine what a string looks like when you strum it. If you play an open string like an A, <laughs> The string vibrates along its entire length, about 110 times per second. But this isn't the only sound that's being produced. If it was, it would sound like this. The reason the guitar and other string instruments sound so different is that there are resonant sounds happening at higher frequencies, at a half the length of the string, and a third of the length, a fourth, and so on. 
You can hear what these resonances sound like by touching the string at each of these lengths. Those resonances are overtones, or harmonics. If you play the harmonic in order, you can hear what Nicole described as a harmonic scale. The root, fifth, and major third, the notes that make up the quintessential major Western sound, are right there in the vibration of the string. It might be the familiarity of intervals connected with these overtones that leads us to like the sound of major scales. As a music therapist, what are just some like real world applications of music mm -hmm. therapy? I'll, I'll talk specifically, since we're talking about nostalgia, I'll kind of go into that realm of how can nostalgia be therapeutic for people? Music therapy can be used in so many circumstances, like for mental health or for kids on the autism spectrum or people with Parkinson's disease or dementia or just like so many different things. So I'll, I'll just focus in on this aspect. But when we think of, especially with dementia or Alzheimer's, right? Where you start mm -hmm. to lose a sense of who you are and what music therapists will do, broadly speaking, music mm -hmm. therapy uses music to work on non-musical goals. So our goal isn't to get people to play music or be musicians or anything like that. It's just to use music to address maybe their cognition or their movement or their emotions or memory or speech, and all these things. Let's say I had a client who um, was older and had dementia and is maybe agitated. They're in a long-term care home and they're confused. Um, they don't know why they're there and they, they're wondering where their spouse is. Maybe their spouse passed away 10 years ago, but they're still, they don't know that, they don't mm -hmm. remember. And, and they're just getting really anxious because everything is unfamiliar, mm -hmm. right? And so my job would be to go in there and um, find out, talk to their family, talk to their kids and find out, okay, what, what were the songs that were really meaningful for them in a positive way? Because you can have songs that are, it triggers some really terrible memories, right. right? And so you wanna be really careful with this sometimes, right? So what are the songs that are meaningful, that are familiar? And then connecting with that person, playing those songs with them so you can get them to sing. And then what happens is that because music is so powerful and brings up these autobiographical memories and emotions that are more po are positive or calm, you're actually bringing the person into a different state where they may still not recognize where they are, they still might not know what's going on, but they know that they're okay because this song is familiar and this song is associated with, you know, being at home or being with friends or um, when they got married or whatever it is, they become calm and they become happy. And now they can do things. And there, there was actually a study about uh, helping nurses to mm -hmm. use songs when they were doing um, like bathing and changing, which is typically the most anxiety provoking things for, for folks in long-term care, yeah. right? They learned, okay, what are the person's favorite songs? And like, what are the meaningful songs? And then had them either play the songs or just sing. They didn't have to be good singers. They just yeah. had to kind of get that song going in the person's head, they saw an incredible difference where people, once they heard their song, it was like they realized, okay, this person's like, it's okay, something yeah. is okay. And then they would, they would go along with whatever they needed to do. Huh. So it's very practical to yeah. you know? And there's been stories of people who have been in a coma for weeks or months or whatever, and then certain songs are gonna start bringing them out. Or there was one case of a woman who had been a pianist, she was in a coma, nothing was working, she was just there. They put a piano on her bed in front of her and she started like wow. playing it and that was the start of her recovery. It is incredible how much music can reactivate parts of our brain. Something that's really neat though, um, this isn't like new research that's just come out in the last couple of years, is that you know when we think about our brains and aging, we we know that that like you hit whatever twenty five and then it's kind of downhill from there, right? Like your yeah. your our brains, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. And if somebody has dementia, then even more so, there's there's brain deterioration happening. And a lot of what we want to know is, well, is there something we can do to prevent that? Like, can yeah. we, you know, although we can't necessarily prevent Alzheimer's dementia, all these things, totally. Um, they, there was a recent study that had people with just mild cognitive impairment or beginning stages of Alzheimer's listen to music for one hour a day that they knew really well, like the songs that they'd known for at least 20 years. And all they did is just listen to it about the same time every day for one hour. And they, they scanned, they did a brain scan beforehand, a fMRI beforehand, and then after, I think they had to do this for three weeks. And they found that the brain areas changed, like the brain changed 
uh, different pathways became more efficient. There was areas related to movement that became more efficient, which is really interesting, and, and memory specifically as well. And then they also had to do like a cognitive test before and after. And the memory portion of the cognitive test improved from before and after. And this is simply listening to music, right? Which is such an easy and enjoyable thing yeah. for us to do that actually can help our brain health um, in, in a small way. You know, maybe this is not, I'm not gonna make overarching claims and being like, this is the cure, we're gonna yeah. prevent all, you know, diseases that are related to aging, but it does something, yeah. which is so cool. That's fascinating. It's yeah. crazy stuff. Yeah. All right, I wanna thank Nicole Richard from Belmont. Thank you so much for the information. It was super enlightening. I, I think it's great for the audience out there as well. Now, if people wanna learn more about music therapy, uh, what can they do? Yeah, you can check out the um, websites for the Canadian Association of Music Therapists, which is musictherapy.ca or the American Music Therapy Association website, which is musictherapy.org. Or if you're really interested in more of the um, neurologic side of things, neurological um, music in the brain, you can look at nmtacademy.co. Awesome. I really love sitting down with Nicole and picking her brain. As we learn to play music, I think it's important to remember that music is more than just those chord structures. There's a powerful and emotional reaction to music as well. As you hopefully get better at those chords, I hope you never lose sight of the magic behind the music. Thanks for hanging out with us today. For more videos like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel right now and ring the notification bell to make sure you don't miss any new content. And look for Curiosity Stream on social media, link in the description. Thanks again.